Hallelujah. Thank you to Brother Jason, the musicians, and thank you that are out there blessing Yahweh and praising Yahweh. And also, I'd like to thank those that are online for the feedback that you've given us. We'll go to our psalm reading. This is a dedication of the house, Psalms chapter 30, verses 1 through 12. Let us read together. I will extol you, O Yahweh, for you have lifted me up, and you have not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Yahweh, my Elohim, I cried unto you, and you have healed me. O Yahweh, you have brought up my soul from the grave. You have kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto Yahweh, O you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endures but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Yahweh, by your favor you have made my mountain to stand strong. You did hide your face, and I was troubled. I cried to you, O Yahweh, and unto Yahweh I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise you? Shall it declare your truth? Hear, O Yahweh, and have mercy upon me. Yahweh, be you my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Yahweh, my Elohim, I will give thanks unto you forever. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. You may all be seated. Okay, we're going to our Torah portion now. We will read Deuteronomy chapter 20, and then the evangel reading is Matthew chapter 26. Brother Eduardo Alcantar will do the Torah portion, and after that, Brother Chris Fouts will do the evangel reading. Brother Eduardo. Shabbat Shalom. The chapter heading in the Restoration Study Bible reads, Rules of War and Those Excused Therefrom. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and the people more than you, be not afraid of them. For Yahweh, your Elohim, is with you, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when you are Come near unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts be faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be you terrified because of them. For Yahweh, your Elohim, is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that has planted a vineyard and has not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there that has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When you come near unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be if it make you answer of peace and open unto you, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto you, and they shall serve you. And if it will make no peace with it with you, but will make war against you, then you shall beseech it. And when Yahweh, your Elohim, has delivered it into your hands, you shall smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the woman and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city 
even all the spoil thereof shall you take unto yourself, and you shall eat the spoil of your enemies, which Yahweh your Elohim has given you. Thus shall you do unto all the cities which are very far off from you, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people which Yahweh your Elohim does give you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breatheth. But you shall utterly destroy them, namely the, Hitti, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their mighty ones. So should you sin against Yahweh your Elohim. When you shall beseech a city a long time in making war against it, to take it, you shall not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them. For you may eat of them, and you shall not cut them down. For the tree of the field is a man's life. To employ them in the siege, only the trees which you know that they be not trees for meat, but shall destroy and cut them down, and you shall build bulwarks against the city that make war against you until it be subdued. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Matthew 26, the events of Yahshua's death. And it came to pass, when Yahshua had finished all these things, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be impaled. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Yahshua by subtly to kill and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now when Yahshua was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Yahshua understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whosoever this good news shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yahshua, saying unto him, Where wilt thou we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Yahshua had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Master, is it I? And he said, and he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had begun, had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Yahshua took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Yahshua unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me. This night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Yahshua said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Then cometh Yahshua with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand and doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Yahshua and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Yahshua said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Yahshua and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Yahshua stretched out his arm and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Yahshua unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Yahshua to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that laid hold on Yahshua led him away. Lo, Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Yahshua to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none at the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of Yahweh and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said, 
unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Yahshua held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living Elohim that thou tell us whether thou be the Messiah, the Son of Yahweh. Yahshua saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witness? Behold now, ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Messiah, who is he that smote thee? Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Yahshua of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were, were there, This fellow also was with Yahshua of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Yahshua, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Chris, and also Brother Eduardo. That was quite a lengthy reading. Uh, one thing that stood out there is Yahshua did not want to get ahead of Yahweh's timing. Praise Yahweh for that. And you know, some of the brothers around here that wear tassels, you know, you're supposed to have four of them right on each corner. Well, somebody is missing one. <laughs> so... <laughs> You might want to inquire. I don't know whose it is. There was questions asked around, and it didn't belong to anybody here, so it might be a visitor. Uh, so, yes, we will go to our special offering portion. We do have two offerings. Sister Pam Artman is going to do one. It's titled, Yahweh is My Shepherd by James Block. And then Deborah and Danae are going to do 10,000 Reasons. So, Sister Pam, if you can... Come forward. We always enjoy the songs with motion put to the emotion. Psalms 23.
Hallelujah. Thank you for that. Sister Pam, that was fitting after the Torah reading that we just had when, you know, Yeshua was at the point of, you know, sweating drops of blood and he was totally dependent on Yahweh. Okay, now you will have uh, Deborah and Danae, 10,000 reasons. I will read while they set up. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Make a joyful noise unto Yahweh, all ye lands. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that Yahweh, he is Elohim. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Hallelujah. Beautiful to see the young generation. Praise Yahweh. You know, I told them, anytime you come through, you can fill up my sheet. And they took me up on that. So praise Yahweh for the young generation. We will go to our Sabbath family. Very interesting thing here. One of these names here, I got a couple of different pronunciations. It just so happens <laughs> it turned into a debate. Can you believe that the pronunciation of a place? Uh, the second one I'll pronounce here is actually Mohawk is what it says online. But uh, we appreciate all the brethren. And as the brethren online encourage us, we encourage you all also, you know, to let us know where you're from. Uh, Hebrews 10, 25, encouraging one another and so much more as you see the day of Yahweh approaching. It is coming, and so we are told to keep busy in Yahweh's business till that arrives. 
So we have here Los Angeles, California, and this other one I was uh, telling you about is some say Cuyahoga, some say Cuyahog uh, Falls, Ohio. And again, that's uh, from a Mohawk tribe. We have Cabot, Arkansas. We do our best here to pronounce the names, and so uh, bear with us. Uh, Ghent, Belgium, Chicago, Illinois, Pueblo West, Colorado, New Hampshire, Toronto, Canada, Arlington, Washington, Tampa, Florida, uh, McMahon, Idaho, Kingman, Arizona, Southwest Ohio, Plattenburg Bay, South Africa, Dallas, Texas, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, the Caribbean, Weatherford, Texas, Loveland, Ohio, Windsor, Ontario, Canada, Federal Way, Washington, Indianapolis, Indiana, Vero Beach, Florida, Northwest Ohio, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Brunswick, Canada, Glade Hills, Virginia, Moline, Ohio, Rogers City, Michigan, Devon uh, from the United Kingdom, Acton, California, Charleston, West Virginia, Albany, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Rogers, Arkansas, Battleground, Washington, Bakersfield, California, and last but not least, British Columbia, Canada. Hallelujah. You know, many nations are represented. You know, we had the French, the English, the Spanish, the Native Americans that were here. So we have a mixture of many, many peoples, and uh, that is a great thing. We've come to worship Almighty Yahweh, and uh, he sends us his blessing. If you would, let's all rise once again. We will sing another selection before we have. We're going to have today a flavorful message. It's called Tasting the Hebrew, Mariyahu. Tasting the Hebrew, Matthew. Brother Michael Bannock will give us that message. In the meantime, raise up your voices to Almighty Yahweh.
like Yahshua, he's waiting for that trumpet so he can come and collect his bride. Praise Yahweh. Thank you to Jason, the musicians. Let's all remain standing and Brother Michael Bannock will come forward and call down a blessing. This time it'll be brief, brothers. Um, Father in the heavens, please let your words be magnified. Let your truth be exalted. Let your Messiah, Yahshua of Nazareth, be glorified in his name and by his blood we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody's playing with the slides here. Where's my... How do you... <clears throat> hey. Brothers and sisters, I'm Brother Michael Bannock from Fulton, Missouri. All the grace of Yahshua be yours. My remarks today are entitled, Tasting the Hebrew Matthew. You know, Brother Javon was teasing me. He thought there was a typo. He thought it should be testing the Hebrew Matthew. And I said, no, it's tasting. Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's the deal. I studied a whole lot about this in the 1980s and the 1990s. I kind of put most of that work on the shelf since then. But I was studying this stuff furiously back then. And I was shocked to find, uh, you know, in recent investigation, that the internet is exploding with interest in the Hebrew Matthew traditions. And this kind of reminded me of what happened with the, the true Mount Sinai. I, I was into all that stuff in the 80s and 90s. And then I says, okay, I've taken as far as I want, put it on the shelf, and I come back to it. Remember, I gave that sermon before the feast. Passover warm-up, follow the water. The internet's exploded with people interested in this. And Javon, Brother Javon comforted me before the feast. He says, remember what you always say, Brother Mike. Uh, I, I was Hebrew roots before Hebrew roots was cool. And when you studied something and, uh, that, that really means a lot to you, and then you find suddenly everybody else is interested in it. Well, what can I say? It, is, it does give me a lift. Thank you, Javon. Thanks so much. I may need this. <clears throat> Brought a lot of props with me. So now with everybody posting a Hebrew Matthew article online, Hebrew Matthew videos, all, it's all over. Everybody's interested in this now. So how am I going to make our stuff stand out? Well, I gave it a clickbait title. The clickbait title. When people see, they do searches on the internet for Hebrew Matthew, they're going to see taste the Hebrew Matthew. Now that sounds interesting and my hope is that uh, well, it's clickbait but I deliver. You know, most click most clickbait doesn't deliver. I deliver. Yahweh willing. 
Well, maybe I'll have to appeal to the uh, control people to uh, advance the slides for me. Okay, now there are at least three Hebrew Matthew manuscripts out there. And I'm acquainted with two of them. The third is less important, but it's worthy of note. The two I can present are plenty interesting in themselves. Uh, but first I'm going to give you a profile of an ally, an ally of ours. He flourished in the uh, 1970s, 1980s. His name is Dr. George. In, uh, in the 1990s. His name is uh, Dr. George Howard from the University of Georgia. He promoted the exploration of ways that Yahweh's name would likely be in the New Testament. And uh, I was plugging into the sacred name movement as of uh, 1975 and going forward. Next slide. Now here's the, the title tag on an article he wrote in 1977, The Tetragram and the New Testament. And um, I'm going to read to you the introductory paragraph from the article, and then I'm going to summarize it for you. And you'll see why he was of great interest to many sacred namers at that time. Next slide. Now we'll get through this, but my clicker is just not doing anything, and I'm... Okay. Maybe the battery's low. We'll be okay. Hmm? Okay. Thanks, Brother Randy. Okay, I'm going to read this introductory paragraph by George Howard. Recent dis... No, I can't read it. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it matters, but uh, I've had an awful lot of trouble putting this together. Computers crashes, setbacks of all kinds. Maybe I'm on to a good thing. There you go. Thanks a lot, Randy. Recent discoveries in Egypt and in the Judean desert allow us to see firsthand the use of G.O.D.'s name in pre-Christian times. These discoveries are significant for New Testament studies in that they form a literary analogy with the earliest Christian documents and may explain how New Testament authors use the divine name. In the following pages, we will set forth a theory that the divine name, yod He wau He parentheses, and possibly abbreviations of it, was originally written in the New Testament quotations of and allusions to the Old Testament, and that in the course of time it was replaced mainly with the surrogate, K-S with a line over it, kappa, sigma, with a line over it. This removal of the tetragram, in our view, created a confusion in the minds of early Gentile Christians about the relationship between, quote, the Lord G-O-D and, quote, the Lord Christ, which is reflected in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament itself. In support of this theory, we will describe the relevant pre-Christian and post-New Testament evidence for use of the divine name in written documents and explore its implications for the New Testament. All right, every now and then, I, I, I like reading this article again to remind me of what he was saying in 1977 before he plugged into the Hebrew Matthew. He's saying, look, in writings before the apostolic era, it was very common for people to use Yahweh's name all over the place. Hebrew writings and Greek writings. The uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are an example of this. But there are Bible experts, Bible scholars, who flourished before Yahshua's time, sometime after. And they were freely using the name. Sometimes they used the shortcuts. Uh, one that turned up in the Greek is Yao, Iota, Alpha, Omega, Yao. Well, that calls to mind the trigram. We might pronounce it Yahoo as in Benjamin Netanyahu. But uh, people were using Yah's name all the time. But sometimes they would use these substitutes, like this K and an S with the line over it. And he's saying that, where he believes that the holy name was in the first messianic writings, over time it got replaced with the surrogate, this abbreviation, just to be careful about it. And over time it created confusion between the L-O-R-D, G-O-R-D, and the L-O-R-D, J-C. This touches a nerve for us sacred namers. It's very frustrating. We've tried to 
Render the holy names in the New Testament, and we are confronted with Greek constructs that confuse who Kurios is when it's talking about Yahshua and who Kurios is when it's talking about Yahweh. And I want that, I, I mean, for decades I wanted that matter settled. That was really eating me away because, you know, we'd publish translations of the Bible and we put the holy name in where we think it goes, but we had no systematic way of knowing every case. When you see Kurios in the Greek, should that be a name or, or a title? Should that be the name of Yahweh or is it a title? And if it's a title, is it referring to Yahshua or is it referring to the Almighty? If I can get documents that have Yahweh's name clearly indicated where it belongs, it becomes a lot easier to sort out that stuff. Now, there is a type of Messiah taught in the world. Uh, my my, my brother-in-law, he, he calls it the JC of the world. He doesn't, he says the whole name, but it's like there's a, a weak kind of watered-down Messiah believed in, in in the world. And he allows sin, anything goes. <laughs> and the Greek text obscures his distinction between him and the Almighty Father. Dr. George Howard's work provided a significant boost to sacred namers in the 1980s by arguing convincingly for the presence of the Tetragram in the New Testament. Yet another scholar who asserts that the name appears in the New Testament is David Trobitsch. He makes this claim even with a Greek text original in view. Well, that kind of makes sense. I wish everybody had time to read this book. It's a real small book, the first edition of the New Testament. He's referring to a Greek text. He said it was actually a runaway bestseller put together by a publisher who gathered all the best texts he could. And David Trobish talks a lot about synchronizations between various parts of the New Testament, how they synchronize together without collusion between the authors. And um, he thought it was done on purpose by the editors. Of course, we believe it was done by the Spirit of Yah. There's all kinds of cool things in the New Testament that connect up very nicely in the Greek. Well, as David Trobish is talking about the, how this New Testament was constructed, he points to a passage that had Yahweh's name in it. And it was not a quote from the Old Testament. But you see, this matches what we see in literary evidence around that time. People were writing Greek things and putting Yahweh's name in it. It wasn't such a big deal, just like we do. We write English things and we put Yahweh's name in it. We have a, a popular Bible from South Africa, line after line of English, and there Yahweh's name is in Hebrew. There's nothing really that strange about it. It's a common practice. It goes all the way back, at least as far as the Septuagint, where well, we know from history and from fragments we've discovered, you've got rows and rows of, of Greek words, and then Yahweh's name appears in the original. Bang, they put it in there in ancient Hebrew letters. These scholars have strength for their findings because Greek Jewish documents contain the name up to the Messianic era. Now, as I said, there are at least three Hebrew Matthew manuscripts out there. I'm acquainted with two of them. And I'll talk about the third one a little bit. But when I say manuscripts, I don't mean there's just three fragile bundles of paper, like in three fragile bundles. They're more like manuscript traditions. Um, there's uh, collections of these in various places around the earth. Okay. First, we'll talk about the Jean du Tillet Hebrew manuscript. Now, the original manuscript was used by Jews to study Christianity. This was in Italy, and it used, them, used by them to prepare for debates with Christians. They'd read in Hebrew what Christians believed, that they'd enter the world in debate. They just wanted to be knowledgeable about what we believed. The manuscript was obtained by Bishop Jean du Tillet from Italian Jews on a visit to Rome in 1553. Now, the thing he got from the Jews, today it sits in the Bibliothèque Nationale Paris, Hebrew Manuscript 132. Jean du Tillet grabbed that, and he transcribed it into the 
standard Hebrew we see in that image on the right. Now that's Jean du Tillet's writing. We'll take a closer look at that in a little while. <clears throat> Jean du Tillet's manuscript is in the uh, Bodleian Library of Oxford. And uh, I have a copy of it here. When I was into this stuff, I contacted the Bodleian Library of Oxford. I said, I want a, a large photostat of that thing. I'll show you an image of it in a moment. If anybody wants to see this stuff, I brought a lot of props today. If anybody wants to see this stuff later, that's fine with me. Hugh J. Schoenfield uh, translated that in 1927. It's called An Old Hebrew Text of St. Matthew's Gospel. I learned about it in the Jehovah's Witnesses interlinear translation of the New Testament. And that's rare. I got one, uh, but it's rare. But they talk about these Hebrew Matthews. They talk about Hugh Schoenfield's translation. They said there was a copy in the New York Library. But I was stuck on a business trip in Austin, Texas, and I thought, let me take a chance. I went to the University library there while I was in town, and bang, Hugh Schoenfield's work was there. So <clears throat> I ordered a microfilm of it. This is a microfilm of Hugh Schoenfield's. Wait, is it the other one? Yeah, it's the other one. This is a microfilm of Hugh Schoenfield's translation. And I could go to any library with this and start cranking and seeing what Hugh Schoenfield wrote. Well, Hugh Schoenfield at that time used to be a practicing Messianic Jew. Um, but toward the end of his life, he got into some really dark stuff. If you look at a picture of him, he looks like he's from some, I mean, really, it's like his face changed and he looked like he was in, he, he, it was like he was in some kind of a scary movie. Um, he wrote that uh, blasphemous thing called the Passover plot. And <clears throat> he essentially walked away from his Jewish Christian faith. But his translation of the Hebrew Matthew was pretty good. And he brought out some good things. We're going to talk now about the Shem Tob Hebrew Matthew. This is a different tradition where the previous one came from a manuscript found in Italy. This one came from Spain. The Spanish Jewish rabbi Shem Tob ben Isaac ben Shaprut, somewhere between 1380 and 1385, published an anti-Christian religious treatise called the Touchstone. The book of Matthew in Hebrew appears in this work broken into bite-sized pieces for rebuttal and commentary. So he'd quote Matthew, and then he'd have an argument against it. Then he'd quote the next section of Matthew and have an argument against it. Around 1985 to 1987, George Howard, who I celebrated a few minutes ago, he published a translation of the Hebrew sections. He just extracted the Hebrew, compressed them into a book, and I bought a case of these. I was passing them around in 1987. I said, this is going to be big. This is going to be really big. When he announced the publication in the religious journals, I knew at once it would be important because of what he found. Now, he located about nine copies of this, this text, around the world. And the number of known copies has now climbed to about 28 manuscripts. But unlike the Du Tillet text, it reads much differently than the Greek. In other words, the Du Tillet text looks a lot like the Greek written in Hebrew, or vice versa, right? But the Shem Tob text has different constructs, different readings, and has a stronger flavor of authenticity. Now that's debated, okay, but that's what I get from it. The third text, I uh, just got to mention for completeness, Sebastian Moinster. Now, here's the deal on him. Um, there's not as much, how can I say, there's not as much known about the text, but his story is so well known, I had no qualms about lifting the information from Wiki. I've, I've read it over and over and over in the decades. But this is essentially what I've read over the years. Sebastian Moinster lived uh, between 1488 and 1552. He was a German cartographer, cosmographer, and a Christian Hebraist scholar. His, cosmo his cosmographia from 1544 is the earliest German description of the world. Moinster published 
a printed version of the Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew in 1537 and dedicated it to King Henry VIII of England. Munster said the manuscript was defective when he got it from the Jews. And it's also said that Munster's text closely resembles the Dutale Matthew. That's what they say. Nobody has published yet an in-depth analysis. But here's the problem. Since the places where Munster repaired the text are indeterminate, he never marked it. He said he fixed it up, but he doesn't tell you where he fixed it. So you're looking at it and you think, well, did he make this or is this in the original? You don't know. So using the Munster text for critical analytical research is difficult. And that's why you don't hear a whole lot of people talk about it. But there is something important coming up, and there'll be more on this fellow in his publication in a few minutes. And it's funny, for a text that is largely ignored and nobody really wants to deal with it, there's actually something very important attached to it. So there are two, there are main players on this stage as of the last, I would say up to the last few decades, my wording there is not quite accurate, up to the last few decades, you have that pathway of Italian Jews giving a document to Jean Dutile. He publishes it, and then Hugh Schoenfeld translated it in 1927. And there's some striking readings in the Hebrew that you think, you know, that kind of makes sense. It throws light on things that may be unclear in the Greek. And then the other pathway is the Shem Tov text that Dr. George Howard accessed, nine manuscripts around the world, and he published this thing here I've got. By the way, this is probably a, I know this is a collector's item now. It's really hard to get. And here I was passing them around in 1987. But this is a treasure. It's marked up. You can see it's got dog ears. It's a, it's a real treasure to have. Now, there are newer players on the stage. Dr. George Howard is gone. But for the Dutile text on the left side of your screen, there's a translation of the Dutile done by James Trim of Texas. Let's see if I can find that. The Basorat Mati, the good news of Matthew. Now, James Trim argues, he thinks this is the original. Now, one of his arguments is that the Aramaic text, the Greek text, and the Dutile text, they all read pretty much the same. He thinks, therefore, that the Hebrew in Dutile is the original. And he argues forcefully about that. Um, the Shem Tob text that was published by uh, George Howard, he seemed to think originally that the, the original was at the foundation. He backed off after he got a lot of criticism for that. But people like me who read this, we think, oh my goodness, there's some real authentic stuff there. Another fellow has picked up the Shem Tob tradition, Dr. Dan Merrick. Now, it may be hard to read the title of his publication. I can't wait to get it. It's called Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew Sacred Name Version. Ooh, maybe he's, he's like one of us. Anyway, that's pretty recent, 2015. But it appears to be English only. Now, we'll be asking for a close-up soon, but for now, you can probably tell on this that on your left is English and on the right is Hebrew. And George Howard did the same thing with the Shem Tob. But Dr. Dan Merrick only published the English here, which makes it of less interest to me. Each camp argues well and strong for the primacy of their preferred manuscript. But this is an old problem. No matter where you are in the world of, of religion, you're always going to have people wondering who has the true ancient tradition. That's always a big fighting area. Even in the Muslim world, Sunni versus Shiite, I get them mixed up, but one of them claims they have the real tradition because their leaders are descendants of Muhammad. And the other side says, no, we have the real tradition because uh, our ancestors were appointed by Muhammad. So everybody wants the real tradition. We find this fight going on 
uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, who has the original tradition. Every religion has this going on. Who's got the real thing? Who's got the real goods? Is it Dutale? Is it Shem Tob? This stuff has some interest for me. As you'll see in a while, there's one thing above all that I'm interested in. Now, the Dutale text has a number of helpful readings. I'll give you one of them. Deuterolite Hebrew manuscript of Matthew contains the missing name Abner, which occurs between Abiud and Eliakim in the Deuterolite text of Matthew 1, verse 13. Those observant Bible students will tell you the text says there should be three groups of 14 names, but the third group has only 13 names. And the scholars are trying all kinds of mental gymnastics to make it work, and they can't. Well, it turns out there's an extra name in the Deuterolite text. In Hebrew and Aramaic, the D, the Dalet, and the Rush look very much alike and are often misread for each other. In this case, a scribe must have looked back up to his source manuscript and picked back up with the wrong name, thus omitting Abner from the list. Now, I've just read to you a section from a thing you can find on the internet called In Search of the Original Words of the New Testament by Ronald L. Hall. Now, there is Matthew 1.13 with the additional name slipped in. And Abiud begot Abner, and Abner begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Now, it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. It turns out there's further evidence of this in the Aramaic text, in one Aramaic text. And this lends weight to the relationship between Dutile, Matthew, the Aramaic, and the Greek. But uh, one thing that really means more to me than anything is the fact that the Dutale text indicates where the holy name belongs. Now, the image I pasted there, I hope you can see, that's a scan of my own document here. And uh, I can always clean up later, I suppose, but I'll just yank out a sheet and let you see what it looks like. That's what Jean Dutale wrote hundreds of years ago, and I got a scanned copy of it. I used a, a system to pinpoint where the holy name is located. You see those black arrows. In the upper right-hand corner, there's an arrow pointing down, and then there's an arrow pointing to the left on the right-hand side of the screen. If you follow those two arrows, they crisscross at the location where the holy name appears in the text. Now... Um, what you saw a moment ago was my scan. Now, this image is from the internet. I took it and trimmed it down and zoomed in. The holy name is represented in the Deuterolite text by three yods. And uh, that looks like uh, Yahweh Elohim, Elohim, Yahweh Elohim there. I don't know the verse for that, but um, the previous one was in chapter 4, verse 10. Now, I'm going to invite you to compare this to what Jean Dutelet really found. What he found is in the right side, and the very same passage is indicated there on the left. Now, um, where are my props? <laughs> okay. That business on the right-hand side, that is medieval Hebrew, and medieval Hebrew is really hard to read. Now, I asked Jonathan if he could do a, a Zoom for me. Many of you here can look at this later. Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to try to zoom in on this. Those of you who are close up, does that look like Hebrew to you? It looks like a bunch of squiggly stuff. Squiggly and looks like a bunch of SpaghettiOs. To me, the, the medieval, one more time, just in case, because I don't know how, what kind of progress Jonathan is making down there, but I do want people to see for the record how hard that is to read. The holy name there is indicated with those three yods, but in the original text taken from Italy, it looks like there's a capital letter L wrapped around it. And that appears throughout the text where Yahweh's name belongs. I was in correspondence with Dr. George Howard. I was privileged 
But some of these professors are real nice, and maybe they like it when ordinary people like us take an interest in their work. But we corresponded a little bit, and we had a lovely conversation by phone. And uh, next slide, there we go. I said to him, you know, some of that Middle Eagle Hebrew is impossible to read. And so he sent me this Hebrew alphabet, a chart of the Hebrew alphabet through the ages. This chart appears downstairs in one of the display cases. <clears throat> but I got mine from Dr. George Howard. <laughs> Hallelujah. I still couldn't read it. I don't have time for this stuff. I just don't have time for this stuff. I have to rely on scholars to transcribe it and publish it. The thing I unscrolled for you, that is the Shem Tob text that Dr. George Howard preferred out of the nine. This one was purchased from the British Library. He even coached me on what to ask for. The wording has to be just right in a large photostat of the Hebrew section. Mm. Oh, I said the Dutelet text has a number of helpful readings, and the original text from which Dutelet work can be found here online. I paid a lot of dough for this scroll. Now you can get it online for free. For those of you on the audio outreach, I'm going to labor through this long link. You can do a free download from the, from, um, the uh, Dutelet the original Dutelet text. <clears throat> HTTPS colon slash slash Gallica, that's G-A-L-L-I-A-C-A -L -L dot B-N-F dot F-R slash arc colon slash one two one four eight slash B T V one B one zero seven two zero two two zero S slash f9 dot image. Okay, if you want to hear that again, just play back the archive, okay? A, a, scan, <laughs> a scan of Dutelet's transcription is available from https colon double slash torahresource.com. Hugh Schoenfield's translation and James Trim's translations are easy to find online after you do a little digging. But my emphasis there up till now has been on due to lay. By the way, uh, <laughs> Hugh Schoenfeld's translation, it's funny, these Hebrew Ritz uh, people, they, they've created a groundswell of interest, and now a fresh publication is available. The Shem Tob text has many more useful readings, but also some puzzling ones. I'm going to give you one of my favorites. <clears throat> now, when George Howard, hold on. When George Howard published this, we have a note here from the control room. Hmm. Oh, I'm going to ask to show the scroll again, please. Anyway, um, when Howard published the, the Shem Tob, which is what I'm pulling back out again, that medieval Hebrew is so hard to read. Um, in his writings, he just got a copy because he thought it would be a good idea to get one. He had read elsewhere that the Shem Tob was exactly like the Deuteronomy text. I'm going to hold it open again for those who, if he can zoom in. That stuff is just so hard to read. I think that's when I gave up of the research. I thought, I can't figure this stuff out. I'm going to rely on others to publish it for me. George Howard comes through very emphatically in his publications, plural, at that time. When he found the Shem Tob text, he was stunned, I mean stunned, to find it jam-packed with puns, word plays, alliterations, clever turns of expression. He didn't expect that. I'm going to take you back to something that... Um, I hate to talk about negative things, but you have to sometimes talk about them like, a, like for an example. How many of you ever heard of the Jesus Seminar? It's a scholarly seminar, the Jesus Seminar. Anybody ever heard of it? Okay. Scholars who are hostile to the Bible, they get together periodically, and they have meetings about what parts of the New Testament can they say for sure are there, really there in the beginning. I mean, these are people that have no faith at all. 
And they're just trying to find out, well, what parts can we accept? And here's one rule they follow. They say that if something in the text makes Yahshua look bad or it's troubling, then it probably happened as recorded. Remember, they're hostile to him. And if it's something that embarrasses him or makes him look bad in their eyes, they say, okay, that was probably there. For example, when he cursed the fig tree, you, you know, that, they said that probably happened. You know, when anything's difficult, they say it probably happened. Now, turn the page. These manuscripts are always in the possession of Jews. They are controlling these things. And when the manuscripts wear out, a scribe rewrites them on fresh parchment. In this case, if there's something in there that makes Yahshua look good, then it must be in the original. Because these Jewish scribes managing these things, they have no motivation to make Yahshua look good. They don't want to dignify him. But yet here he is popping off with expressions that are a snappy, powerful, thought-provoking. Here we have Matthew 5, verse 9 to 10. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of the Almighty. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, the word for peacemakers in the Greek uh, has something, you know, in Hebrew. It's a word that means to chase after, to run after. Blessed are they who pursue peace. But the word for persecuted is also the very same Hebrew word, exactly the same Hebrew word. And it means chase, sometimes with hostile intent. Here we'll copy the definition from Strong's. Radaf, a primitive root to run after, usually with hostile intent. Figuratively, gone by, chase, put to flight, follow, follow after, follow on, hunt. It also means persecute. This is in your Hebrew dictionary associated with your ordinary Bibles. Strong's number 7291. But Matthew 5, 9 through 10 is better translated in light of the Hebrew Matthew. Blessed are they who chase after peace, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. Blessed are they who are chased after in persecution, for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know that the Jewish scribes who managed these documents didn't put something like that in there to make Yahshua look clever, but it's there. In the Hebrew Matthew, especially the Shem Tob is really jam-packed with that stuff. It's, it's amazing. It's delicious. It's like I'm standing there in the open field listening to my master teach when I read that stuff. Here's an example of that word in Hosea 8.3. Israel have cast off the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. So blessed are they who pursue, vigorously pursue shalom. And then there's the word shalom. It itself has a bouquet of meanings. Wholeness, peace, health, everything go nice. Oh yeah. Functionality. They must have loved listening to him. Here's another one from Shem Tov. This one means a lot to us. Now, the standard Greek text has a Trinity formula in Matthew 28, 18. Um, why should I even have to read this? You know, Elder Allen has spoken on this at least twice. This Father, Son, and Holy Spirit business there looks like an ecclesiastical edition. There are scholars who don't know what we know who said... There's a problem there. There are Trinitarians in ancient Christianity, Trinitarians who quoted this passage and never mentioned Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in the Shem Tob Hebrew Matthew, it says simply, And Yahshua drew near to them and said, To me has been given all power in heaven and earth. Go and teach them to carry out all things which I have commanded you forever. No Trinity formula. Do you see where I get the feel that Shem Tob is the greater sense of authenticity? Okay, I'm going to just take a time out. I prepared some additional notes. Yeah. Talked about word plays. Now, this, I want to talk about two things that are common between Shem Tob and um, the Dutale text. Remember when Yahshua, I think it's in Matthew 11, around verse 7, he 
He speaks of John the Baptist, and he says, what did you go out to see, a reed shaken by the wind? Really seems like an odd reading, doesn't it? Well, he he did say that. He did say, did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind? Now, what I'm speaking about is not on the screen. I'm pointing it out to Matthew 11, 7. Well, it turns out the word for reed is Strong's number Conan, number 7070. Conan. And it simply means read. But the word for zealot, the zealot, somebody's all fired up about something. It's kanai. So the word for read is kane, and the word for zealot is kanai. That's Strong's number 7068. Well, that's where it comes from. So when they heard him say that, they simultaneously, it was a word play. He said, did you go out to see a zealot Shaken by a spirit? Slash, did you go out to see a reed shaken by a wind? It was a play on words. This guy must have been great to listen to. Oh my goodness. And and on top of it all, he's speaking with a hick Galilean accent. How does that grab you, huh? I don't know if any of you like uh, Texas accent or uh, Louisiana accent. But those, oh, oh, the Eastern Tennessee accent. Oh. Oh, these beautiful faraway accents. Now imagine somebody speaking, though, a hick accent, and he's talking brilliantly like this. That's why they said, where did he get this knowledge from? Now, um, the Shem Tov and the Deuteronomy text both have that feature with the uh, reed shaken by the wind, where the, the Hebrew sounds like, at the same time, a zealot shaken by a spirit, because the word for wind and spirit are identical. Another feature they share... I didn't uh, prepare any notes for this, but I think it's sufficient to say on the passage in Matthew 5 where it talks about the permanency of marriage, the Greek text makes it sound kind of weak. Like, let man, what Elohim hath made, let man not put asunder. It sounds kind of weak. But the wording, we can look at it together if you want, but the wording in the Hebrew, both Shem Tov and Dutale, the wording is emphatic. What Elohim has brought together, man is unable to separate. It's uh, really striking in its tone. Okay, we're going to take a break now to lay a foundation for appreciating the true value of these Hebrew texts. We're going to talk about Yahweh versus other. Yahweh versus other. Okay. When you um, Look around, study, research, just keep stumbling across these critics of the Bible who try to say that Yahwism, that's what I'm calling our religion right now, Yahwism. We are sometimes called Yahwists by outsiders. They'll say Yahwism was actually slapped together by a bunch of other religious traditions. I probably misspelled Zoroastrianism, but they have teachings that resemble the Bible. Buddhism has teachings that resemble Yahshua. There are Sumerian myths, Mesopotamian myths, Hinduism. Now, back in the uh, 70s and 80s, there was a real popular image of Krishna. Maybe some of you from my generation remember seeing images of Krishna playing a flute, and Krishna's foot is on the neck of a snake. Maybe some of you remember that. Well, that's a, a, that is a remnant, like a little fossilized custom of... Uh, the prophecy that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent and the serpent would bruise his heel. There's Egyptian myths. For a little while, one of the pharaohs of Egypt, Akhenaten, he became monotheistic. He said there's only one deity, it's the sun, and his name is Aten. Because Egyptian is a Semitic language, Aten does bear a resemblance to the word Adon, doesn't it? Well, he tried to destroy all traces of their, their polytheistic paganism and become monotheistic. So there's critics who say that monotheism came from Egypt. There's Babylonian myths, the Gilgamesh epic. Parts of it read like the story of Noah. Now, one good reason to reject these theories, obviously these critics haven't sat down in a room together and compared notes. Because if you were to bundle all these claims in, in one big ball... It would mean that our priests, our patriarchs, and our prophets were very occupied running around trying to gobble up all these pagan traditions. And our history doesn't read like that. 
our history is pretty, it's pretty linear, revelation and application. And it is preposterous to believe all of these are going on at the same time, but there's critics who will argue fervently about it. The truth is in the next day, this diagram here. Yahweh's true ancient religion, the most ancient religion on the earth, will find remnants and traces elsewhere. And they pick this stuff up and run with it. Now, Yahwism is distinguished by at least two features. Yeah, it's a sort of a Bible apologetics thing, but there's also evangelical content here too. Number one, Yahwism is distinguished because we have a vast prophetic schema pointing to Yahshua's first coming. I don't know how much you know about other religions, but you take all the religious teachers of the world, all of them, line them up against the wall, line them, get them all up there, Buddha, the Buddha, Nanak, the Bab, Muhammad, we will humbly ask Yahshua to join the lineup, even though he doesn't belong with him. And you ask him, which of you guys has hundreds of years, thousands of years of prophetic anticipation of your coming? None of them do. Which of you have prophetic anticipation of where you're going to be born, how you're going to die, where you're going to live, what your teachings are? None of them have that. Yahshua of Nazareth has that. Not only that, Yahshua of Nazareth even has prophecies talking about the guy who comes before him. We have prophecies about John the Baptist. Hundreds of years before he shows up. Yahwism is distinguished by that. It's also distinguished by one other thing. Israel was entrusted with a kingdom and covenant identified by the name of the one true universal deity. I don't get to talk about Yahweh's name enough. <laughs> Could someone advance the slide for me? There we go. Let's look at that name. It's a Yod plus the verb Hawa. Yod is the, is the pronoun he. Hawa is the verb to be. There's a standard ordinary verb to be in Hebrew, Haya. Equivalent to H-Y-H. But his name is constructed with the most ancient and novel verb to be. You get the Strong's number on Hawa, you'll find it's only used six times in the Bible. Like when Isaac blesses um, Jacob, he says, be ruler, over the, uh, be ruler over your brethren. The word be there, the word be is Hawa. It's only used six times in the whole Bible, a very rare poetic form of the verb for existence. Those of you who are homeschoolers, or maybe you're not homeschooled, you should have memorized the verbs to be. Verbs that indicate existence. Am, is, are, was, were, be, been, could, would, should, have, has, had, seem, appear. <coughs> Taste, smell. These are all verbs that indicate existence. <coughs> he exists. That is a very precise meaning for his name. Friends, think about it. What's, what is one of the most prominent blasphemies against Yahweh? Is that he doesn't exist, the claim he doesn't exist. No, he, he doesn't exist. No, nah, nah. I don't think he exists. Prove to me he exists. I would, only, I, I would say the only blasphemy worse than that is someone pretending to be Yahweh. And um, maybe that's in the offing. Yahweh's name is true, it's authentic, it's universal, it's easily understood, it's unique, and it is self-evident. This is actually a handy evangelical tool, especially in this age where people's faith is really failing them. They're not sure the Almighty exists. The universal authenticity of Yahweh's name, he exists. Well, we call him that name. He exists. There's a psalm. I think it's 14. And Jose, you're good at this stuff. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Aren't those the ones that are at the same? Everybody got that? Okay. Well, one says, the fool says in his heart there is no Elohim. The other one says, the fool says in his heart there is no Yahweh. Well, that would seem odd 
to put a name in there. That's like saying there is no Michael. There is no Jose. But in this case, it's a wordplay in Hebrew. There is no Yahweh. Because his name literally means he exists. The key to cherishing the Hebrew, Matthew, and all texts like it is this. These texts do not have their value abiding in novel readings and controversial passages. That kind of business has been going on for centuries. Yahweh's name in the text is the genetic marker lending weight and authenticity to the writing. That's where my interest has always been from the very beginning. It's very tempting to go chasing this reading and that reading. Oh, maybe there's some secret here that's been hidden from me. I just want to know where my father's name is. That's all I care about. Everything else is interesting. Even if a reading is questionable due to scribal error or whatever, the holy name therein is a tip-off that Yah's people are in on it. That's what I want. I tabulated the 22 places where Yahweh's name appears in the Shem Tob and the Deuteronomy. In the Shem Tob text, it's indicated by the Hebrew letter He for Hashem, the name. In the Deuteronomy text, I showed you it was three Yods. I just represented it by three I's, three letters I. Okay. Now, they don't agree in every place. These are texts owned by Jews in two parts of the world. Most places they agree. But here's the juicy part. You see the sections I've highlighted in yellow. This is big. You know, we should sound the horn. The parts that are in yellow, those are fresh, brand new, New Testament material. Think about it. When the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's understandable if a Jewish scribe said, oh, this Christian document quotes the old, the Tanakh. Uh, let me put the holy name back in where it belongs. And he'd do that. I could see that. But when he comes to, to new material that doesn't appear in the Old Testament, the scribe would never put Yahweh's name in there. He would never dignify it with that. This was eye-popping. I saw this in the Deuteronomy text early in my own research. Okay. You know, I had all this, all this investment in the Deuteronomy text just because I wanted to find out where the name was. And then when George Howard's Hebrew, Matthew came out, here's the second edition, you bet I went looking for that. Yahweh's name is appearing in fresh New Testament material that never existed before in the Old Testament. Case closed. Our Messianic brethren used Yahweh's name. There's no getting around it. Because a people hostile to using that name preserved it. There's 22 places where that appears, but they don't fit all on one uh, sheet. I may have to ask you to advance the slide again. There's the rest of them. And uh, this was... Um, that chart was put together by me. Now here's a chart, next slide, of there's 22 people who translated the Shem Tob. Here's 11 of them. There's 11 more on the next sheet. This chart was found on the uh, Wikipedia and it was done by a guy named John Belushi. Shows all the people who've been trying to translate the Shem to Hebrew Matthew. There seems to be a lot more interest in that today. We're almost done. Remember, this is just giving you a taste. But it's for me, it's electrifying to see Yahweh's name in New Testament writings. There's more. There's more. Yeah, we're coming to an end, but there's more. Here's a, a reading from Matthew 23, 23, and Luke eleven forty two, 42. I'm going to show you the superiority of the Hebrew roots approach to the scriptures. In Matthew 23 and Luke 11, Yahshua talks about the weightier matters of the law. But the wording isn't the same. Matthew says, judgment, mercy, and faith. Luke says, judgment and love of Elohim. They don't match. But if you bring into account the Shem Tob, the Shem Tob mentions four things. The judgments of Torah, kindness, truth, and faithfulness. Now, I'm going to say the line on judgment is in 
large agreement among those three sources. But the Shem told Matthew explains how Matthew and Luke are interpretations. I remember Randy Demet gave a sermon on this years ago. You could do translations that do word for word, or you can do translations that do idea for idea. Matthew's translator to Greek and Luke's translator to Greek took the ideas from the original Hebrew and they rendered interpretation. I'm going to draw your attention to it. The first line, judgment appears across all three. So I'm not going to harp on that. Uh, there we go. They're, they pretty much agree. So I'm going to let that stand. But when it came to chasid in the Shem Tob, the word for kindness, chasid, well, when kindness is talking about human beings, it's talking about love between humans, unconditional love. But when it's talking about religion, chasid means love of Elohim, as in the Hasidic Jews. So Matthew and Luke took it in different directions. They're translators into Greek. But the original word in the Shem Tob is chasid. And we know chasid has a bouquet of meanings. Let's go to the next one, truth. Okay, we don't quite see... The word amuth, truth, rendered in either Matthew or Luke. It looks like they bundled that in with an interpretation for amunah. Because amuth and amunah, they're related to the word amen, means firmness. Matthew renders it as faith. Luke renders it as love of Elohim. So the Shem Tob source is a kind of a decoder ring for how these Greek translations emerged in Matthew and Luke. I'm going to just wrap up by talking about further developments. Uh, a Hebrew version of the book of Hebrews has been found. This is electrifying. A Hebrew, well, we've known for years Hebrews would be in Hebrew, right? What, are they going to write it in Latin to a bunch of Hebrews? Remember I told you Moinster would come up later? We really have no use for Moinster's as of yet that we found. But James Trim bought every one he could find around the world, and in one copy of Moinster, attached to it is a Hebrew version of Hebrews. No comments, no provenance, no explanation. So James Trim translated it. He was shocked to find this. And again, it includes Yah's name in the text. And this time it's included as the Hebrew letter He. There's two verses there, 1-1 one, one and 10-30, that have fresh New Testament material. They're not quotes from the Old Testament. Yahweh's people used his name, even in the New Covenant era. Okay, there's more. We're almost done. We have found Hebrew fragments of John and Luke have emerged. Those include Yahweh's... It's just the first few sheets. There's the first few pages. But those include Yahweh's name all spelled out. Now... There's a Hebrew version of Maccabees 1. Now, the first Maccabees is not scripture, but there's a reason this is important. James Scott Trim, again, he bought a, a copy of this. This document has been in the National Library of Paris since 1896. They represent Yahweh's name with a double yot. But here's where the value of this is. This finding does not make first Maccabees scriptural. Rather, it lends weight to the analysis methods that predicted a Hebrew origin would be determined. Because there's people who look at the Greek of 1st Maccabees and they say, hey, this reads like Hebrew. That must be a Hebrew original. Finding a Hebrew original lends weight to that, especially with Yahweh's name in it. Finally, new kid on the block, some guy named Dr. El Garza. We got to watch this fellow. I feel about him the same way I felt about George Howard um, 30 years ago. Dr. El Garza on YouTube has dedicated his work to exploring all New Testament manuscripts in Hebrew. He claims to have found 3,000 New Testament manuscripts. It's hard to believe, but we got to watch this guy. Now, where did he find those? He hasn't said, but everything else we found up till now is in libraries, the Cairo Geniza, it's a massive collection of, of stuff, and uh, the Jewish seminaries. Jewish seminaries have a lot of New Testament material. In summary, for many years, sacred neighbors have claimed that much of the New Testament was in Hebrew. The Hebrew Matthew has been around for a long time. Independently, scholars of varying interests have brought them forth. 
Many are surprised at the cool, authentic things they find in there. More manuscripts have emerged. Hebrews, John, Luke. We lost an ally in Dr. Howard, but uh, fellows like Dr. Garza and others will be good to watch going forward. Above all, I am watching these developments for placement of the holy name. I thank you for your kind attention. Yahweh bless you all. Well, just like Paul used to say in his scriptures, if we speak in tongues and nobody understands, how are we going to say amen or are we going to be in agreement? So if somebody claps their hands, well, you know, that's the emotion that came out from the message. You know, when uh, we got those little hard-hitting closing arguments, uh, it's pretty interesting. And you can look it up. It's in, uh, I believe it's Genesis 27. Somewhere around there in the 20s where, you know, Jacob told or Isaac told Jacob, you know, be ye ruler over you. He says it right there. Hava. So looked it up, double checked it, make sure everything is there. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Thank you to Yahweh for delivering as he always does. Shows us new things that maybe we never considered and lets us know that he has always been and will always be. That's the greatness of Yahweh. Nobody else can compare to that. And nobody else can compare to the prophecies that Yahshua fulfilled. Thank you, Brother Bannock, for that presentation. Let us all rise. We will uh, call down a blessing, uh, sing another selection. The musicians can come forward. For the local brethren, we do have a prayer meeting, 530. Prayer meeting, 530. So the scripture says, when you are done eating, do not forget to bless Yahweh. That's what the scripture says. And Yahweh has answered our prayers here. Brother Joshua Deck will come forward and call down a blessing. Is he around? Is he doing security? All right. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. We're having some great messages and we'll have more to come. Let's all bow our heads. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe. Father, we thank you for this wonderful message that we have heard today. It's so inspiring to know that um, these ancient texts have been written down and passed along for all these years uh, for us to find and study and just learn the truth and to hear the words of Yahshua in his uh, native tongue and in the tongue of creation. Father, we thank you for this wonderful Shabbat and we thank you for the music and all your blessings and the fellowship that we share. And we ask this prayer in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. Yeah.
Hallelujah. Let us close with Psalm 26, 11 and 12. Let's read together. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations will I bless Yahweh. Hallelujah. That's what we're doing. Blessing Yahweh in the congregations. Thank you all for joining us. May Yahweh give you a good week and many, many blessings. And don't forget to prepare for the Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. We know that your time is valuable, and we appreciate that you spent it with us today. We pray that you have a fantastic week and that the message and worship from today will help strengthen your walk and faith in the Messiah, Yahshua. Yahweh be with you and your family. May He guide you and keep you safe. Until we meet again, Shabbat Shalom.